You fucking race traitor, how dare you not stand up to these inferior people invading our country? You can't demonstrate they aren't mentally inferior because we've evolved differently in other ways, therefore they probably are genetically inferior. These and many other things have been posted on my comments. Screams of white genocide and race traitor filled the internet halls of the so-called race realists when the new Star Wars showed a white woman and a black man, who only had a potential to have a romantic situation, and didn't actually have one, yet, claiming it promoted white genocide. Whiteness. What an arbitrary word that means nothing yet everything in this nation. What makes you white? Well, it usually refers to a set of gene mutations that produces less melanin in various levels and shades. It specifically propagated more the colder it got due to increased clothes wearing and less sun exposure, reducing levels of vitamin D. Also, it involves a type of skin and hair texture we got from interbreeding with Neanderthals along with allergies, certain neurological conditions, and higher levels of substance abuse. The gene expression is on a gradient over most of Europe, and with the whitest being from the coldest regions and a nice tan in the southern Mediterranean regions where they mixed with the North Africans since the Roman Empire. East Asians and Native Americans evolved a slightly different skin pigmentation traits for dealing with vitamin D deficiencies in their own way. The pseudoscientific concept of race was always and has always been related to ethnicity, which is mostly culture. However, prior to mass transit, it also had more distinct features caused by isolation therefore inbreeding. Cousin marrying is still not really stigmatized in much of Europe. The entire purpose of sex is to wash bad genes out, often caused by genetic damage. The closer related you are with someone else, the dirtier the water is. Through genetic recombination, you can even duplicate prior harmless genes that become harmful. There's a link in the bottom bar about how incest works. Bacon's Rebellion solidified the concept of race in the U.S. minds of black versus white when the British class system didn't work anymore to control the American lowlies. When the black slaves were freed in Britain, they married with the lower class whites and few batted an eye so long as they knew their place in the caste system and didn't try and rise above their class they were born into. In the U.S., that was completely taboo. With the rise of eugenics and Darwin's theories completely abused, the U.S. and Britain especially classified races of the world, and they ranked them based on hierarchy, with, of course, English at the top, German and French below, Spanish and Italian below them, Scandinavians lower, Poles and Russians below them, Slavs and Irish even lower, Jews and Chinamen below them, Middle Eastern and Indians below them, Native Americans and Roma below them, Africans, and finally, Cohesions or Pygmies. This list is, of course, an example of the kind of rankings they use, and not precisely historically accurate, because each decade the rankings on the list change based on arbitrary feelings. On top of that, ethnicities are redefined every generation just as nations and values are redefined. Detesting the Irish and thinking they're a mongrel degenerate race is now laughable, but a hundred years ago they were despised, and in the 1920s the KKK rose up to oppose them and Italians against Catholicism. Over the generations, light-skinned European groups integrated and blended into the population, but no matter how much they changed their mannerisms, blacks never could blend in and be accepted due to bias against skin, and many pretty much gave up, even though some have up to 80% European genetics, but so long as the skin color was not from the European side, which is quite genetically common, they were treated as inferior. While there are white supremacists with high levels of African in them, that just express as white skin phenotypically. I had a Serbian white nationalist comment, which seems to be sadly rather common in the old Soviet bloc, call me a race traitor. I called him an inferior Slav, way below my superior English and German heritage, who of course were superior because we discovered the science to define race in the first place, placing you people as inferior. What did you scientifically do in comparison to us superior English and Germans? Or perhaps the entire concept of race is complete bullshit and we're actually equals as human beings. He didn't get it. Must be that inferior Slavic brain not being able to grasp complex concepts or possibly financial stress lowering IQ and increasing racism. Eugenics and the ideas of being pure breed white came about at the same time that we created dog breeding and a ton of inbreeding that led to pure breeds to be some of the most genetically sickest and most psychologically temperamental dogs out there. During the 1900s, Britain was obsessed with the idea of maintaining and keeping the British race pure, especially the upper class. British, of course, excluding Irish and Scottish. They went so far as to believe and protect the obvious farce of the Piltdown Man, 
as evidence that humans evolved in England and therefore were the first and best, and we all evolved from them as distorted form, even though scientists pretty much of every other nation that saw it believed it to be bullshit. In 1919, 1,500 graves of Germanic people was found in Britain. The evidence became overwhelming that there was no British race. The archaeologists who discovered this were crushed and depressed that much of their genetics descended from the dirty Jerry's they had just been at war with. Growing up from day one, the concept of race was ingrained into me with Jesus loves the little children, red and yellow, black and white, and all the white people enjoy the stereotypical comedy, so the message I kind of got from it from the adults around me was Jesus loves them in spite of the fact that they're weird. When you ask your average white supremacist in the U.S., those four along with the Jews is how they usually classify a race. Once again, completely arbitrary. Forensics does utilize skull features to narrow down a person's origin named Caucasoid, Negroid, and Mongoloid, but that is hardly an indication of which pure haplogroup you're from. Dogs have a ton more skull shapes than we do and are still all descendants of wolves. Human ethnic populations are at best subbreeds, created only by isolation, inbreeding, and slow genetic drift with no purpose in mind, unlike bred dogs. But even then, Concordance has a great video on the genetic bucket chain that shows that we weren't really all that genetically isolated due to trade, travel, and migration. 1, 4, 5, or even 12 doesn't even begin to cover a descriptive enough range of races to describe the haplogroups and lump them into categories. There is more genetic diversity on the continent of Africa than there is in the rest of the world, many with European, Asian, and Polynesian traits. If we're going to go down to define race, it would include the eight major haplogroups of Africa, from the very tall, thin Maasai to the very short Cohesions. If you were to define race, these eight groups, along with maybe Neanderthal-related Eurasian Americans and Denisovan-related Oceanics, would make up ten racial groupings that would make so much more genetic sense than the yellow, red, black, and white Jew we arbitrarily define based on how melanin expresses. America is a melting pot. We reduce the amount of inbreeding at a dramatic rate just through immigration. In Britain, everyone is at least fifth or sixth cousins, and the people there were more closely related before rapid transportation. We Americans are mutts. You can't tell from our distinctive physical features what regions we are from. Africans actually have less genetic disease afflicting them than us whites, thanks to less isolation and more crossbreeding. Some master race we are. The worst of this is mostly caused by the fact that so many of the royals generated offspring in the general peasantry, and they were some of the most inbred people on the planet, the Habsburg Empire being the worst offenders. It's like Europe was a massive genetics experiment where they tried to see how many genetic diseases they could produce in a lab of white mice. The best thing for European genetics is the EU and US and free movement of people as they need to have some fresh mixings of genes. Mixed-race kids with very distant haplogroups are even less likely to have genetic diseases as they can wash out even more genetic problems. All regions groups have specific genes. The more mixing you have, the higher chance you have of getting nothing but good genes. So am I a race traitor? Oh, hells yes! But if you maintain your belief in the very stupid concept of race, you're a species traitor. I could jokingly be referred to as a gradual choice-based eugenicist, but using actual science where people get access to genetic counseling so they may decide not to have kids if their genes increase risk, but don't have to, and get as much haplogroup mixing as people would like, depending on who they fall in love with, without a stigma to kill off genetic defects from centuries of inbreeding. If you want to call that white genocide, then you can call me White Hitler. Wait... If melanin content is why you consider yourself great, or how you define yourself, I feel very, very sorry for you, and it won't mean the end of white skin. I have a friend who's half black and looks like me with red hair and freckled white skin, while Obama looks as black as they come. Malcolm X had red hair. These traits viewed as exclusively white will still pop up again and again as a mix of dominant and recessive traits in the population, just without all the awful genetic diseases our royal heritage gave us. The South Park episode of future people taking their jobs is wrong. The people of the future will not all be brown and look the same. We'll just have more combinations of good genes than ever before. To be honest, I get it. I get the whole platonic ideal of the perfection in a world of people who look like you. As a redhead growing up, we all feel a little out of place and treat it a little differently that only a fellow ginger can truly understand. Such as natural and dyed red-haired people 
have told me that everyone treats them or interprets their reaction to things as having a temper because that's the stereotype we have. You don't have a name, you have a nickname as a kid. Your real name is forgotten in place of one feature you happen to have. Red. Carrot Top. Whatever. And we can't really complain about it because it's not racism, and we aren't really persecuted by it, but it gets really fucking old. I wish there was a homeland for us as a boy, but due to our genes, even in the biggest redhead population, we are still a minority. Emotionally, I get the appeal, but you know, once I get to know you guys, you non-gingers are alright. No matter your hair color, even the trans gingers who need to use artificial means to look how you feel, you guys are just as good as we are. You have your geniuses and idiots, saints and assholes, and people all in between. Living with you as opposed to being segregated among my own has ensured that I can't really stereotype you all based on the few that I have met. Although, since we are so non-prevalent in the population, apparently you can stereotype us. Blending will do us all some good and make it harder to hate and stereotype. And that way we will all be healthier and happier as a planet.